So let's give a big round of applause to Jenny Jones. Thank you, Anne. And uh, when Matt opened, he said, I'm the first proper Green Party peer. <laughs> now, he doesn't mean I'm very proper, because um, I'm probably not. But what he means is, I'm the first one that's been appointed. We've had Green Party peers in the past, but they've crossed the floor of the House of Lords. They've come from other political parties. They did a fantastic job, but unfortunately, they're all dead now. And so I am... <laughs> That's, what, that's how you retire from the House of Lords. Um, I, uh, so I am now the sole Green peer in the House of Lords. And one of the things I very much hope from this election is that we get a very good vote nationally. It would be fantastic to get more seats, but in fact, realistically, a big vote nationally would make all the difference to whether or not we might get more peers in the House of Lords. And, and as Anne said... Just one green can make a huge difference. We've seen how Caroline Lucas in Brighton has made a huge difference. On the London Assembly, there's been two of us out of 25, and all the political parties on the London Assembly, Tory, Labour and Lib Dem, are greener than their national counterparts. We've constantly brought in the experts to talk about the impact of climate change and so on, and the other political parties have heard it, and so they are actually greener than um, their national parties. Now... Um, all the roles I had that Anne outlined, most of those were under Ken Livingstone. And it was possible to work with Ken Livingstone. Uh, we Greens, in, the sec in Ken Livingstone's second term of office, he actually needed our votes to get his budget through. And that was a very exciting four years because we were able to negotiate with Ken Livingstone. One of the things that we negotiated was um, a £50,000 grant to do some research on a road crossing over the Thames. And uh, that research actually stopped Ken building a new road over the Thames, a new, um, not a public transport bridge, which we would have loved to see, but a road a traffic uh, bridge. And Ken was absolutely furious about the fact that his gift of £50,000 had been used to such good effect. Now, on housing... I was quite shocked. It was only today that I read in one of the Oxford Green Party leaflets that actually Oxford is more unaffordable than London. And we think we have a huge problem in London because, of course, more and more people are coming to London, more and more in the southeast, and homelessness is increasing. The benefit cuts from this government have meant that more and more people are falling into arrears on their, on their, um, on their rents and more and more people being forced out and into temporary accommodation and, and sometimes onto the streets. One of the things that I do once a month is go out with, um, with a homeless organisation and it's, it's blatantly obvious that there are more and more people who are living rough simply because... And some of them say that just a few months before they had a job, they had a house, they had a family, but the fact is they fell into uh, rent arrears, uh, they lost their job, and then they lost their family and they lost their house. So housing is an absolutely crucial issue for a secure society. And also, of course, for not just a secure society, but also for a fair society. And here in Britain as well, where we have um, occasionally inclement weather, I think housing is an absolute right. And it, it seems to me that this government, the previous government, I hope I can say, has made life worse for the more vulnerable in society. Now, the, uh, the Green Party housing policy nationally, we are saying that we actually have a vision of how everybody could have a decent, affordable house. And we, are, we would plan to provide half a million social rented homes one of the big problems that we've had in the past four years, well, in the, in the past, I would say, decade, well, well, actually, since Margaret Thatcher. Oh, I'm so sorry I didn't see you up there. How lovely that there's an overflow. <laughs> <laughs> um, really, since Right to Buy came in, we have never replenished the, the social rented housing stock. And this, of course, is a huge problem. There will always be people in society who can't afford their own, to buy their own homes. We need social affordable rented homes. And councils, particularly under the previous government, have, been, have seen their budgets absolutely slashed. And, of course, they have not been able to build new homes. 
And it seems to me that it is time that we took this problem much more seriously and provided, as I say, half a million homes. So we would end the right to buy, because although it's lovely for those people who manage to buy that house and they, uh, they then make a huge profit in a few years' time when they sell it on, actually it takes every single right to buy purchase takes a house out of the social sector social housing sector, and we think that's quite wrong. We would also take action on empty homes. There are, even in London, there are empty homes, and it's, it is ridiculous at a time of such a housing crisis that, we don't, that those houses exist. We would uh, bring back at least half of... There's 600,000 empty homes at the moment, and we would plan to bring back at least half of those into use. I think that one of the things about creating enough housing is uh, we, we talk a lot about debt, for example. And w when I was a child, debt was actually something you didn't get in. I come from a, a quite poor working class family. My name of Molscombe is actually the council estate that I grew up in when I, from the ages of 0 to 18. And when I went into the House of Lords, it was quite important for me to track that distance because I can tell you the distance between Molescombe, where I grew up, and the House of Lords is a lot more than 60 miles. It is, it, it, it is the most incredible um, difference. Uh, Molescombe, where I grew up, is an extremely deprived housing estate. <coughs> Obviously, not all social housing now, but um, the, the, the journey from that sort of background into the House of Lords is, is probably something that not many people can do in today's society. And quite honestly... If we are going to have a fairer society, housing is something we have to focus on uh, very, very strongly. Um, one of the things that we have done, I think, generally, is pe people expect to own... A lot of people now expect to own their own homes. And this is a massive amount of debt that people take on. I started by saying, when I was a child, we tried to avoid debt because we knew we could never pay it back. And so if you wanted something, you saved up for it because otherwise you knew you would never be able to pay it off. And, but now debt has become more acceptable. We, we, many of us take on big mortgages, and we know that the bank owns the house, but, and, but we can. We expect to be able to pay that debt off. And it's the same for a government. It's the same in society. This, uh, all the other political parties talk all the time about debt, about how we've got to reduce our debt. But actually, of course, there's nothing wrong with debt if you are going to pay it off. And if we start to build social housing, what we can in essence do is when we rent out, when we let those houses, we get a return of something like two and, two, two, two and a half times the, the, the value of the debt. And so actually we can pay the debt back and people get housing. And then we can reinvest any profits back into more housing. It's a very simple equation. And it, it seems to me that the other political parties are missing out on this basic acceptance these days that debt doesn't have to be bad. Oh, I've got 30 seconds. Um, I, I, will, I will close by saying um, the Green Party manifesto is fully costed. I have the numbers here. I believe in them. Um, I was at an event last night where people were saying, well, the Daily Mail says, well, I can guarantee that our manifesto is a lot more reliable than the Daily Mail, which a lot of people do seem to believe in. Um, and so if, if anybody does want a bit more detail, it's all on our website, or you can come and see the figures here. And quite honestly, this is, I think, the only way to start rebalancing our society a little bit and, make, and, and just bring a lot of the people who are now in poverty and who are in extremely vulnerable, bringing them back into a better life. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to be tough on the timing. <laughs> no, that's fine, that's fine. <clears throat> well, thank you very much, Jenny. And now, Professor Danny Dawling. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, I should start by saying I'm not a member of any political party. Uh, but I have gone on the record of saying that in this county I'm supporting the Greens in four, four of the constituencies, National Health Alliance in one, and slightly food British in Labour in the <laughs> constituency. Now, when you hear what I've got to say about housing, maybe you understand why. Um, my belief in politics, I think this really matters. We just have a very complicated situation at the moment. So a lot of people are very confused about what they're going to do and how they're going to vote. 
all the parties say we need more housing. They are all correct because our population is rising and if we are lucky, it will continue to rise. A very large amount of our housing crisis in this country, the vast majority of it in fact, could be sorted out by allocating housing in a fairer way, as we used to do in the 1970s and 80s and even the early 90s. We've now got back to using our housing stock as inefficiently as we last did in 1921. That is, very large houses, largely empty, poor families crowded in to small houses. And you can look at each census and you can see this happen. So most of the solution to the housing problem in Britain is helping people downsize when they have housing which is too large for them that they don't want to be in and they can't afford the heating, but there's nowhere they can actually go when they want to downsize. It's solved by helping people not feel the need to have a second or third home as much as they feel the need to have a second or third home. It's helping dissuade overseas investors from buying flats and simply leaving them empty in London. There's lots of things that can be done. Uh, you can also increase rights for tenants and dissuade amateur landlords were thinking they're going to make a huge profit out of becoming an amateur landlord. But, and this, this is the most crucial and tricky issue, you are going to have to build some housing because our population is rising. I've yet to see a single politician of any party stand up and say the reason we need, need such a rate of house building is immigration. But that is the reason. That is why we have increasing demand. We've been having fewer than two children per couple since the late 1960s. So it's actually for immigration that we're going to have to build. Um, and I can see why politicians don't say that, but that is the truth. And this is an immigrant city. Um, I'll do something I, I've done in every talk I've given in Oxford. I just ask you to put your hand up if you're born in Oxford. Just to check. Great, we've got one, two. Okay, welcome all the best <laughs> of you. Two up there. Okay, two more. <laughs> Um, uh, there's only been one place I've actually given a talk, over a dozen talks in the last year and a half here, where half the audience were actually born in Oxford. This is an immigrant city. This is an increasingly an immigrant country. Uh, but that is the reason for building. Now, all parties will say they're in favour of building. They want to do it in different ways. It's far more sensible, I think, to do it the way the Green Party is suggesting doing it. None of them, for very obvious reasons, will tell you at all where they would like to build. Because the minute you say where you would like to build, you lose votes. Um, this is, this is a, a very big problem, but we're not going to get the houses and flats built unless we start talking about where they're going to be. This city, the average house price is now 16 times the average income. Even if you look at poorer parts of the city, you're talking seven or eight times. It's, it's unaffordable and it's the most unaffordable place. Uh, the rents are astronomical, which is why so many of our school teachers only stay until the age of 25 and then leave. It's great having lots of young school teachers, but you do need a few older ones. And you do need a few people willing to be head teachers. I can go on and on about the, the problems of this city. The city has up to 40,000 people driving every day across the green belt to park on the park and rides and wherever else they can park their cars to come into work. Uh, 40,000 people driving a day is not good for reducing road traffic accidents and fatalities. It's about the most dangerous thing you can do in a day is drive a car. We don't want or need 40,000 people driving a day across the green belt to get into the city. And that was not the purpose of the Green Belt. The Green Belt was not established in the 1940s to try to maximise our carbon pollution. But that is what the Green Belt is now doing. At the same time, we have 5,000 people hopping over the Green Belt to London who live in Oxford. That is about to increase substantially. The fastest possible way to increase that, at least they won't be going by car, but is to build a station up at Kidlington where it takes one hour for a direct train to go to Maribor, which is at the top end of Harley Street. And that station opens later this year. So if you think it's bad already in Oxford, you wait to see uh, what's going to happen over the next couple of years. You could argue that Oxford should shrink. It should become like Windsor, with a nice castle, lots of tourists, young people wearing silly frock coats and so on. Uh, and in a way, Oxford's hardly like that. But I don't think 
that is, is an aim that is particularly laudable. I think we're very lucky to be living in a country that people want to come to. We benefited from it enormously. So we need to provide a housing for the people who come and are going to come. So the question is where? Oxford cannot build up. It can't build power blocks. They're not allowed. I think we need to build around the edge of Oxford, off the floodplain on the sides of the hills. There was a plan in the 1920s to do this. It was almost certainly thwarted by the university who were afraid of the car factory expanding. So you're talking about the equivalent of Barton West, which is 800 odd properties, but again and again and again. It really matters how you do it. If you allow private speculators to do it, they'll build barrack homes with two car parking spaces. If you plan it better, if you use the model of Milton Keynes, but without the roundabouts and the roads of Milton Keynes, you can, do, you can do a much better job. There is enough land within three or four miles of car, park, car parks for very large people to live within cycling distance of the city. There is a golf course on Hinksy Heights with wonderful views, which could be full of fairly low-rise flats for the elderly who want to move out of their very large North Oxford houses <coughs> but they want to leave all their friends behind. But you need the Green Party to say, we are happy to take a chunk out of the Oxford Green Belt. We will use the ability to cycle as, as, the, as the, the, the side on how much of a chunk we do take out of the Green Belt, but we will actually talk about taking that chunk out. Uh, and it's a very difficult thing for them to do, but they need to do it. On top of that, you need to facilitate the expansion of Didcot and Vista, and you need trams or, or faster trains so that people are happy to live in those places, they can get into work easily, and they're not facing a commute on the A34 sitting in traffic jams. And, however, but we need an actual commitment to where they're going to build, because it's easy to say 200, 300, 400 thousand. It's much harder to say where the assessment for this county is that by 2030 we will need another 100 thousand homes in the county. Uh, building them on the edge of villages causes huge upset in some villages and just as, as small towns as the road. This housing is needed on the edge of Oxford and in the towns near Oxford where you can move around using public transport and the Green Party need to say that that is what they're committed to actually doing. Thank you very much. <laughs> because I think we want to hear your questions. Let me just start by saying, in yesterday's Guardian, charities have, uh, housing-related charities, UNICEF, Save the Children, etc., have declared that the UK is in breach of its own UN human rights commitment to provide people with adequate homes. And I think this is a stunning indictment on our country. Okay, I can't go on at, at length. Let me just say quickly, um, well, actually, I'm going to change what I was planning to say, because I'm going to disagree with Danny <laughs> about building on the green belt. Yes, Oxford has a housing crisis. And before I go into the solutions, let me just say that I think, I think our Labour-run city council has been following the wrong strategy. It's been following a market-led strategy and buying down to developers. The, West, the development of the Westgate Shopping Centre Oxford doesn't need more shops, bringing in more traffic and air pollution. It needs more affordable housing. We could have had affordable housing there. In fact, affordable housing is being pulled down on the Westgate and there is none being replaced. The Barton development, it's not following its own... The council has its own policy of providing 50% affordable housing there and in fact only 40% has been provided, which means there are 80 affordable homes which are, which are not being built. Okay, that may seems small in you know, overall city terms, but, but every, every house counts. Um, we, can, we could be building over car parks. I agree, we can't have high rises, but we can have low rises. Two or three storeys over car parks, shops. There are lots of brownfield sites. Oxford has 800 empty homes, empty houses. Not to mention the 900 or so second homes. So we could introduce... Well, first of all, bring some of them, compulsory purchase some of them and turn them into affordable flats. And we could introduce a much higher council tax for the empty homes. So I believe there's a lot we can do before we even consider going on the green belt. Although 
Personally, I do think it's <coughs> sensible to have a green belt review for the whole of Oxfordshire, because yes, there is a housing need, but we need to look at the whole picture. But I don't believe that immediately thinking about building on, on the green belt is the solution. So if you really care about affordable housing in Oxford, and I never expected myself to be so party political, but I have actually, the more I've looked into this, the more I've seen the record of the Labour-run City Council is completely inadequate on housing. They have not prioritised housing sufficiently. So if you really care about affordable housing in Oxford, you need to vote Green, because we have been fighting in the Council since the 90s to push and push and push. In fact, it was our initiative to put in this 50% uh, target of affordable housing. And OK, in Barton they haven't reached 50%, but at least they've got 40%, that's something. So Elise, our, one of our most long-standing Green councillors, is in the back there. If you want any more details about how much the Green Party has been fighting in the Council, Elise can, can provide all those details. Um, so th it's been one of the top priorities of the Green Party, both in Oxford City Council and nationally as well. Now, I want to give you all a chance to, to ask questions, so please stick your hands up and we'll have a dialogue. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's my question particularly to Danny, but to everyone. <clears throat> the big bus companies say they cannot increase the number of uh, buses going through Carfax. We can't change it. There's no additional infrastructure we can put in because of the rivers and the university, medieval. Um, so what can we do? Because as, as you push up the number of people, whether they live in Vista or they live in Barton or they live on this ideal ring, um, they're going to sometimes want to use buses to come into Oxford and it's reached capacity. Right. Thanks. Perhaps, actually, we are short of time. Um, the, I should mention that the Friends Meeting House has been extremely kind to let us use this room today. It is their day of prayer and they want to be quiet, and we've got to be out of here by quarter two on the dot. So, um, could you all keep your questions very short, please, and I'll take three at a time. So, two more questions there, and sorry, at the back uh, page on the window, but, but you, you, you first. Um. Well, I, I certainly agree that the, the, there's a need for housing and filling up empty houses and so on is an excellent idea. This, Danny Dorling has, has highlighted the issue of immigration. The Green Party has an open door immigration policy. Uh, surely one of the, one of the objects uh, of, of a, a long-term sustainable policy for, for this country should be to look at uh, immigration and population policy and, and have a target or something. Oh dear, okay. uh, Thanks. I should Sorry. say that I am an immigrant to Oxford, but I have lived here for over 40 years. Okay, thanks. And Paige, on the window. Hi, um, if Oxford is more unaffordable to live than in London, then why isn't why don't, if we decide to study in Oxford, why don't we get the equivalent of student finance that people decide to live in London? Very good question. Um, Danny, do you want to take the first? Jenny, the second. Do you want to take the third as well? Uh, the, the danger of doing the equivalent student finance, or in the case of some colleges who help their employees buy housing, is you just push the housing prices and the rents higher and higher. Um, I'm not, you know, but people really are struggling, but that's the danger of it. Uh, you're right about the buses. Uh, the first thing we need to do is to get more cars out of the city. The fastest way to do that is to do things like build a canal basin at the bottom of Nuffield College over that car park <laughs> with water. Um, you really want fewer and fewer people driving into the city. There are plans for trams through Oxford. We've got these wonderfully straight east-west, north-south roads uh, that could take more people. The ma major arterial roads probably need to go one way, uh, which would make it easier to get people in. Uh, but housing in Oxford is as much a transport issue uh, as it is a housing issue. Uh, because the city is so constrained. This is one point. It means you have to go green. You have to cycle, you have to walk, and if you can't do those things, you have to accept it's going to be a bit of a slow journey getting into the city. But that is the only way that Oxford can be larger, and it can't be done on an individualistic basis. And these things really happen. I mean, stuff changes. When I grew up in the city, coal market was full of cars. Uh, then, they, then they took the cars out, then it was full of buses. And the buses had bus <coughs> wars because they competed in private companies. And then they took the buses out of Corn Market. Um, so this is not utopian to say you could get this 
bitter, big, slightly bigger, better city. It's actually what's happened to Oxford over the last 40 or 50 years. And the city is extremely lucky that many of the road building schemes have stopped and never went ahead, um, which allows you to have one of the greenest cities in the country. Uh, we're in the top three for cycling. We could be the top one mm. for cycling. Uh, in the Netherlands, a quarter of pensioners cycle as their preferred way of, of moving around, let alone the rest of the population. And it really is a pretty flat city, although if you've been here a long time, you may think that that's a hill. <laughs> think, but it, you know, yeah. hill. And you can even have something you could hold on to to drag you up that hill if you want to. <laughs> Thank you, Danny. Jenny, you'll take the next two questions. Um, on, on students, I mean, there's all sorts of things we can do, for example, to make being a landlord a little bit more of a responsible position and actually have less, uh, you know, so they actually make less profit at the moment. They have all sorts of rebates and concessions and so on. So that's something we could do as far as housing is concerned. But our policy also includes the scrapping of tuition fees and, the, and the, uh, the restoring of student grants. And that obviously would make life as a student much easier because then you would not end up with 40 or 50,000 pounds worth of debt at the end of your degree and, and you'd be starting fresh. We'd also, of course, introduce a living wage for everybody by 2020. And um, it, I, I, I cannot understand how a living wage is not part of every 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 party's manifesto. On this issue of immigration, I'm not sure what your definition of immigrant is, because I come from a Celtic background. As far as I'm concerned, unless you're a Celt, every single one of you is an immigrant <laughs> to my country of Britain. And so I, I don't know what your definition is. Um, I was on a platform last night with UKIP, who, of course, when they talk about immigrants, they aren't talking about people from the north of England flooding down to the southeast, which is one of the problems that the southeast is heating up so fast. They're actually talking about people coming in from outside of Britain. And, of course, we do have a free movement of EU people within Britain, which we celebrate. We think it's incredibly healthy. But UKIP was talking about um, people coming in from outside the EU and taking our jobs and, and taking our housing and taking our hospital places and so on. But you know what? Our public services are helped by immigration. First of all, most people who come here come here to work and pay their taxes because they're trying to actually improve their lives. Secondly, of course, they actually do work in our public services. So one in four doctors in our NHS is actually foreign born. These are people who help our economy and help our public services. That's not even to mention the nurses who are born abroad and come in and, and work incredible hours. Really, the failure, the failure is one of government policy. The government has not invested, for example, in the NHS in the way that it should have done. What we have at the moment is nurses who work for the NHS are extremely badly paid. So what they do is they go into the private sector and they work for private companies who then charge us, the taxpayer, the government, more money than we pay our own nurses. And so we pay more for those private... It's a creeping privatisation of our public services that we have to stop. It actually isn't financially or economically viable. So this is not about immigrants per se. This is about government failures to keep our, our um, economy going. And uh, on this issue of the Green Belt, I absolutely reject the idea of building on the Green Belt. This is a lung for all of us. Now, you here in Oxford, you've got, a lovely, you know, you've got lots of lovely trees. You've got a quite green city. But the, the concept of the green belt is to preserve a green lung around towns and cities, and we desperately need that. I mean, I personally, I'm presuming the golf course is on the green belt, is it? One is. There's one over inside the city. Let's build on golf courses, yes. shall we? Absolutely. Let's... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's build on a few car parks. I mean, you know, this, this idea that... Um, we have to reduce our road traffic. I absolutely 100% agree with, with Danny on that. Of course we have to reduce road traffic, but you don't do that by, by building on the green belt. You do that by closing roads. You actually make it less easy to travel, and you, at the same time, uh, I mean, in London, what we did, we put in the congestion charge. Yeah. I, I will come. We put in the congestion charge, which deterred people from driving, but at the same time, all the money that came from the congestion charge after, after the, 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 um, we paid off the, the process, it all went back to public transport. So we massively improved public transport. From when I was first elected in 2000, uh, when Ken was elected as well, buses were actually 
very grubby, not very mm. nice in London. They are amazing now. You know, extra services, they go further, they do all sorts of, you know, all sorts of better night buses and so on. We, there are different ways of reducing traffic and no building on the green belt. You have to close the hospitals is the only problem. Um, we have some of the largest hospitals in the southeast in Oxford. There are people commuting in from Birmingham to work in those hospitals because they cannot live in Oxford. Most of the growth of the Oxfordshire population is going to be you, well-off, middle-class, ageing people. That's, that's <laughs> the coming into the county. English-born immigrants coming in. That's the growth. And one of the attractions of coming to Oxfordshire are those hospitals. Because, as you know, as you age, you're going to need to use them more. And there's going to be lots more elderly people. They're going to acquire all, the, all those doctors and nurses, an increasing number of whom will be educated elsewhere and will come in as immigrants. They need a bed to sleep in. If you don't build beds for them to sleep in, you cannot have those hospitals in this city and you can't have your healthcare service. You can protect the Green Belt about London because London can build up around its stations easily. Oxford cannot build up, so you have to go in to the Green Belt. And at some point, I will watch the Green Party say this in the next 10 minutes. <laughs> to the uh, person in the purple um, top. And was there somebody I missed back there? Oh yes, the tap in the glasses. So uh, three questions, one up there, one here and one here. Um, we were struck up here by the fact that the first three questions were not directly about housing but the things very linked to it. Um, so can I continue in that vein by raising a concern that if the response to a housing problem in Oxford is to find new places to build more houses, then as Danny says, it's an attractive place, people will want to come and stay here, they will want to bring businesses. The businesses that usually come are high-tech businesses. They will therefore want to recruit in a British labour market, indeed a European labour market, and therefore what you actually find, you're building houses for more people to come into Oxford again and increasing traffic. And I do wonder, not just Oxford, but the whole term value, whether or not there is a case for saying the congestion has reached the point where we actually have to have serious policies on a much larger scale that aim to incentivise people to set up in other parts of the UK, particularly the north of England. Yeah. 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 But actually, we have to take this point. If people are talking of building on flood plate, there's a vein of magnets creeping into the water supply, frankly. And I think that of we have to face the point that maybe we have to have a controlled economy where we actually begin to actually prohibit economic growth of certain kinds and direct it to places where it's going to do more good. Yep. I'm Thank going you. to bring you up a membership form because that's all <laughs> Green Party policy. If that's um, you, you next. Um, what do you think of the council's proposal to criminalise rough sleeping, particularly after the 38% cut to homeless shelters? And the one at the back with the glasses? Um, this is just a quick thing. Um, I think I think Dawn just made a really good point. I mean, like, the thing about building on the green belt is the council has already reviewed how many houses it can build in brownfield field sites, and it's about £7,000. That's a 23,000 house shortage by, the 20, mm -hmm. by 2030. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, on a regional level, you know, I think it's inevitable you're going to have tensions between your three policies of unlimited in on, on, a, on a regional level, you know, unlimited integration, build more houses, but protect the green belt. And surely the answer is, are the mindset set ups over the top? Maybe you accept in your messaging that there's a tension between these three policies, but say on a national level, some regional imbalancing needs to be done. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Should I go first, Jenny? Of course there's a tension between, between a lot of these policies. I mean, there's a tension between building new houses and the carbon input that that takes, and it's often better to refurbish if we possibly can, but then, of course, uh, refurbishing is, is very expensive and it's difficult to retrofit all sorts of um, insulation <laughs> and, the, and, and the sort of eco-improvements that we would like. There's always a tension. But one of the great things about the Green Party is people always think we're slightly um, unrealistic, but actually uh, the common sense embedded in our policies, I would say, is extreme common sense. And so we have to, we have to play out those tensions and we have to make sure that, in, in you know, Green's overall 
take a long view. We don't only think about beyond, up to the next election. We actually think about what's happening, what will be happening in 20, even 50 years' time. And this idea of re-stimulating other bits of the UK, of course, that makes absolute sense. We are, it's what I was trying to imply when I talked about the overheating of the southeast. And in fact, a lot of the homes that we've actually, um, we're talking about are in the north because people don't want to live up there anymore, because they think that everything's happening down here. And in fact, councils are giving away council houses up in the north because they can't afford to, 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 to keep, you know, they're empty and they can't afford to, to keep them anymore and they can't afford to demolish them either. So, yes, that's, that's all very true. Criminalising rough sleeping, that's appalling, absolutely appalling. Um, you don't criminalise something that people can't... I mean, there are a very... What we find in London is there are a very few people who actually won't go in, indoors. You know, for various reasons, they actually want to live outdoors. But the vast majority of people, of course, don't want to sleep rough because it's not very nice. It's very cold in the winter and you get very wet. And, and in London, there are shops that are actually hosing down... The councils are actually hosing down doorway shops so that uh, people can't sleep rough. It seems to me that it's, it's tackling the wrong end of the problem. Right. Thanks, um, You're completely right... Uh, we do need to see more growth in the north and the, and the southwest and in Wales and in Scotland, and particularly in Northern Ireland. Um, luckily, at the moment, we don't have population decline in any of those areas. So it's not that we're suggesting building houses here because they're being knocked down there. The knocking down has ended because of the population rise. There was an enormous demolition in the 1990s. That, that has now uh, stopped. The difficulties are the things that you cannot easily move. And you can't easily move the elderly of Oxfordshire. They really don't want to go away from their friends and, and their families, which is why you're going to have to expand hospitals. You don't need to expand the universities that much. The university I've just been in, Sheffield, we got up to 60,000 students in the city, a quarter from overseas, loads of rooms in, in Sheffield for this wonderful thing for the city. University expansion can be in exciting urban areas with decent nightclubs. It <laughs> <laughs> isn't needed in Brooks and the old university that much. Um, but the weight of pressure from people who are already here is so high that you have to do something. We already have families living a family to a room, another family in another room in the same property. That's already begun. We moved them to Birmingham. And they lose their connections with all their friends and their relatives locally, which is the worst thing you can do. So you have to address this problem now. Oxford has the most wonderful real green belt. It's called the floodplain. And it's getting bigger. And it is enormous. But when they designed the green belt in the 1940s, they were completely unaware of how big the floodplain was. Um, and so they designed it tightly into the city, not realising that we actually have this enormous amount of area that you can, you can not sensibly build on. It is green to build property near the middle of the city. That is a green policy. You are otherwise promoting pollution and commuting if you don't do it. Thank you. Well, I'm going to wear two hats for a moment and I'm going to very quickly say something. I think we need to have a conversation in Oxford about whether it's more important to preserve our views or more important not to build on the green belt. Paris, for example, you fit a million people into a, a small space, they build high and you get lots of lovely views in Paris. So I think we need to have that conversation. Unfortunately, we can't have it now <laughs> because we have to be out in about 30 seconds. Uh, I also want to say very quickly, completely against the PSPO, the Public Safety Protection Order. I mean, it's appalling to criminalise something that people have no control over and the most vulnerable in our society. Um, on immigration, I'd just like to say very quickly, you, many of you may know, that in the decade 2000-2011, immigrants made a net contribution of about £2 billion a year to the Exchequer, and that would pay for an awful lot of services. Plus, as Jenny says, about 40% of our NHS staff are foreign-born, and about a quarter of our NHS staff are on tax credits. They're just not paid enough. So again, you know, we're going to bring in immediately the living wage as a minimum wage, and by 2020, £10 an hour. I am really, really sorry we have to end. We just 
you know, we're, we're grateful to the Friends Meeting House for le letting us be here. We just don't have enough time. Uh, could you please all join me in a round of applause for our wonderful two speakers, Jenny and Daphne. Thank you.